Hello, Houston. We're going to continue our journey into theories of, of uh, personality today, hopefully getting a little bit into psychopathology or the study of abnormality, time permitting. We had talked uh, previously, you'll remember, about the type theories, most recently of William Sheldon's. And today what I want to do is to show you another variation on the same kind of, of theory that is now talking instead about trait theories. Both of these fall under the general category of trait or dispositional theories. This one, by Allport, takes a very different approach. What he did was to sick his poor graduate students onto the Oxford International Dictionary and basically ask them to dredge out any word that related however remotely to the study of personality. And they ended up over the years creating a list of about 18,000 adjectives related in one way or another to personality, which created quite an analytic process or problem that they needed to, um, to deal with. Net result was that, that by combining names and so forth, they were able to create eventually about 4,000 trait names and that in turn still then had to be analyzed by hand actually uh, to combine words based on meaning. And so in essence what they did in, in this process in collapsing from, from uh, 4,000 to 171 what were called trait names um, was basically to eliminate synonyms. That is they put synonyms into common categories and made sure that antonyms were in, were in distinct categories and so forth. And then provided some factor analytic data which eventually reduced it to uh, 35 trait clusters. These trait clusters ultimately then yielded what are called cardinal traits. So all of this work was done basically in order to eventually identify 12 cardinal traits according to Allport's trait-based theory of, of personality. The cardinal traits were basically the broadest, the most descriptive ways in which our language talks about personality. Those in turn were analyzed or subdivided, if you want to think about it that way, into a series of what were called central traits. The central traits basically cover kind of intermediate situations rather than being the most broad stroke uh, description of personality. And those in turn were then subdivided into what were called secondary traits. So the secondary traits essentially are those features of yours or my personality that only show up occasionally um, under very explicit conditions. You act one way in front of your boyfriend or girlfriend, a very different way in front of your parents and so forth. So those would be secondary traits that appear here but may not necessarily appear there. <clears throat> so far, so good. One problem. Another investigator asked to borrow the words, did not look at the rules that, that Allport and his group had used to create the, the 12 cardinal traits or identify them. He, this other person and his research group went through the entire um, 18,000 words and generated a different series of combination rules for putting the words together, equally defensible did all of the subsequent follow-up analyses and ended up with 14 cardinal traits instead of 12, only about half of which actually overlapped significantly with, with Allport's original work. And so the net result was that there were a number of things that, that did not work effectively um, in this particular theory. Among other things, for instance, their development of you know, how we get to this state was never actually stated. Um, the biggest problem is that, that you've got essentially nothing more than an analysis of the language that we all use. And what the tie is between that and personality is a little difficult to identify. Uh, the net result was that these theories in general have pretty well fallen by the wayside. Not totally, because there, there are others that are, I think, for instance, who's still working in this general area. But I don't think the impact has been substantial on modern day analyses of, of personality. Uh, there's a lot of disagreement over appropriate techniques to identify the individual traits. Um, the trait names are really statistical groupings of factors rather than necessarily any logical link to the name and thus some feature of, of personality. And within individual traits, um, they may vary as much by, as a function of environment as they do by attributes of you and I. So for a variety of different reasons, um, it didn't work particularly well. Um, it is objective and it is quantifiable. So it does have some positives, but there are some strong negatives associated with it. One of the major things that has actually come out of this work is the understanding of, of concepts like introversion and extroversion. Those basically, I think, more than anything else, trace to the work of, of the trait theorists. And so for that, it isn't that this is a theory group that has not impacted personality. It's just I would argue that it's been relatively minimal, certainly in comparison to things like uh, psychodynamic theories. If we look at human views of self, 
it has undergone three kind of major blows in the last uh, half millennium. Um, we walked around here in the 1400s thinking that we were the center of the universe. That is, everything revolved around the Earth, given the then present uh, analogy or, or analysis of what our state is on, on Earth. And then all of a sudden, here comes Copernicus, in, in the, um, right at the beginning of, of the uh, Renaissance, telling us the, um, we're not the center of the universe. We're on a relatively minor planet revolving around a relatively minor star somewhere out in left field of this galaxy, let alone any other galaxies that exist in the, in the uh, universe. So we lost centrality in the universe. For several hundred years, things were okay, and then all of a sudden we're still walking around thinking that we are the supreme species, the best of the best, you know, dominant in the animal hierarchy. And then here comes Darwin in the 1800s suggesting that we are not only not dominant in the, in the animal hierarchy, or if we are now, our dominance is going to be short-lived. That if you buy into the tenets of, of uh, evolutionary theory, the implication is quite clear that something better than us will evolve later on. Something better able to handle parking jams, for instance. But um, it'll be a long-term process, but we are simply on top now but it's not going to last. So we've now lost dominance in the animal hierarchy. We're still walking around thinking, well, at least I control everything that controls me. And then here comes Freud in the early 1900s saying, no, wait, you're not even aware of all the things that govern your personality. There are unconscious urges in your personality actually impacting how you behave. So in the short span of 500 years, we've lost centrality in the universe, dominance in the animal hierarchy, and control of ourselves. It has not been a good half millennium so far. We'll see what else happens. But let's look at psychoanalysis. It is a very complex theory, and it's also a technique for treatment. Today, what we're going to do is discuss it only as a theory. Later on, we'll come back and look at it as a, uh, as a treatment technique um, several lectures down the way here. It is based on two different types of observations. One of these is what we'd call deviant or irrational behavior of a very small, limited number of primarily female patients um, in Freud's practice as a then nerve doctor or neurologist. And then subsequently, he broadened that to include observations of everyday life, the kind of things that any of us may do. Um, dreaming, uh, slips of the tongue, uh, various mistakes that we make and the implications of them and so forth. But these are the two primary data sources that were used by Freud to develop what turns out to be one of the most sophisticated theories of, of human interpretation and behavior that has ever been developed. And it has impacts way beyond psychology. I'll give you a little bit of a hint of that as, as we go through it. Um, in essence, the other thing is that, that he essentially assumes absolute determinism. And by that, what I mean is that when Freud is, is analyzing human personality, he is operating always as a medical doctor, which is how he was trained. And so he has an absolute determinism that kind of undergirds the theory. His point being that for any personality difficulty that you have, he's going to argue that we can find a place in your personality or places where that problem generates from. So that it is an absolute deterministic theory. That is, any problem is going to have a specific identifiable site or site, source of sites. Um, sites rather than site. But in other words, specifically identifiable problem sites that will be relevant here. Given that, um, he then has two dimensions or factors that kind of undergird how we analyze um, the personality. And I want to talk about these a little bit. One of the things that made Freud very popular was his ability to develop analogies, which really kind of communicated the essence of what it was that he was trying to, to um, say about the human personality. One of the early analogies that he suggested was an iceberg as a representation for what he calls the conscious-unconscious dimension. That is, he is suggesting that some of the factors that control us are directly in our awareness. There are, there are other factors that we are not aware of, i.e. are unconscious. And so he actually suggested the use of an iceberg to illustrate this particular uh, process. If you know anything about an iceberg, you know that ice, when it floats in normal water, uh, it has about one-seventh of its total bulk above water level. And the vast majority of it is either just beneath or well below the surface, depending on the size. The same thing is actually true of an iceberg, but unless it's floating in something like a Coke, um, you can still see all of an ice cube, is what I meant to say. An ice cube would represent it. 
But the iceberg, I think, is more appealing because of the deeper, darker kind of implication of what's going on way down underneath. And that was really what he was reaching for in this situation. So the conscious factors are those that you are immediately aware of. The processes that you're considering as you talk to somebody, uh, gee, their lipstick is stained, their blouse, or, or gee, they've got a piece of spinach hanging off their second and third tooth, or you know, whatever it is that you're processing when you're interacting with somebody. Those are the things that are essentially the conscious determinants of, of how you interact with somebody. You have a much broader array of information in your immediate pre-conscious. And by that, what I mean, what, I, what I'm really talking about there is things that, that would, in another area of the course, we would have talked about it as your active and passive vocabulary, for instance. All of the words that you could reach for to utilize if you want, as well as the concepts that are, that are retrievable, basically, uh, within your mind. Example, think about, picture for me for a second, an image of your favorite other person of the same or opposite sex, whoever floats your boat these days. Um, your ability to, to create that image is relatively easy, okay? In fact, some of you may have actually been sitting there daydreaming about him or her right now. Now let's get to it here and pay attention. But in essence, that's something for the rest of you that you were able to pull into conscious awareness very easily, a piece of cake, basically. That is in what Freud would call the pre-conscious. Now the border between each of these states is a little bit gray, I guess would be the, the word to use. It's a little bit vague or, or complex. But there are certainly some things in your pre-conscious that would take some effort for you to, to drag up and, and remember. Do you remember, for instance, what your date to your high school junior prom was wearing? And it might take you a while to retrieve that. You might ultimately be able to, maybe not. Um, but some of that is the kind of stuff that's in your pre-conscious. Freud argued, however, that the largest amount of the factors that determine our behavior are in the vast, unplumbed depths of our unconscious. And this he reserved for the bottom of the iceberg. Of ill-defined size, he's basically arguing that many of the factors that govern how we behave on a day-to-day -day basis are actually lodged in our unconscious. And to anticipate something that we'll get to uh, several lectures hence, one of the reasons psychoanalysis is so expensive is because of the fact that, that your psychoanalyst and your unconscious are at war with each other. The one is trying to defend itself against incursions and revealing what's going on, and the other is trying to make inroads into your unconscious. That's one of the reasons, for instance, that Freud studied in such detail things like slips of the tongue and dreaming, because he viewed dreaming as the high road to the unconscious. That was his, his uh, phrase for it, that he thought that was the way. Examining what you dream about was a way to get unfiltered, um, unconscious thoughts brought to the surface in such a way that they could be analyzed. The other thing um, that he also talked about, and I forgot to put it on the list here, the other general concept on which the theory as a whole is based is the concept of libido. Libido or libidinal energy is just that. It is psychic energy. It is that that is driving your, your, um, your personality. Um, Behavior, he viewed, is not just a response to external stimuli in quite the same way that the behaviorists themselves would view it. Um, but Freud basically developed his theory in the late 1800s when things like chemistry, physics, and biology were all making significant strides studying energy. Biologists were studying the Krebs cycle and, and how energy impacts cellular activity. The chemists were looking at, at the relative attractive and rejective qualities of various elements and, and compounds. Um, and the physicists were studying magnetic, electric, uh, gravitational, and various other kinds of energy. So energy cl clearly played a role in these other disciplines. He didn't want to be left out at some very casual level. And so the net result is essentially the libido, libidinal energy, creates an inner state of tension. What it does is, is to organize the body to try and resist it or reduce that tension. So this essentially is, is basically a, um, um, a driving force. And when Freud talks about sex as one of the driving forces, that was a very kind of huh, word in late Victorian um, Austria. Um, and he was really using that word in modern times in a much more broad sense. That is, it was not just the carnal aspects of sexuality that he was talking about, but might, might almost in some ways be captured more by the way you and I use the word love now. It was really a much broader energy or driving force than just, just carnal sex, um, which may surprise some people. But that's libido, which is basically the, the other element that kind of undergirds everything else in the... Um, in the theory. Now, if we look at the structure of personality consistent with the procedure I said I was going to use, um, 
this is probably for uh, Freud's major contribution, aside from his his um, um, dealings with the the unconscious, is that he essentially formed a comprehensive theory that essentially suggests that there are three elements that, that constitute the structure of our personality. And those three involve the id, the ego, and the superego. As I said, analogies was one of the very effective things that he had allowing him to explain his, uh, his theory. And the, the analogy that he suggested for the relationship between the id, the ego, and the superego was a Russian troika, essentially a three horse pulled mechanical device or cart. His idea is that when we have the id, the ego, and the superego all fully developed, what we want is to have all of them pulling more or less equally. That is, this horse works, uh, this uh, cart works best for a farmer if all three horses are pulling more or less equally. If two of them are pulling fine, but one of them is lagging behind, that will either weaken the two horses that are pulling full load, or the, the weaker one will get pulled under. Uh, and so either way, it doesn't operate well for the ultimate history of the uh, future of the, of the cart if all three horses are not pulling equally. So by analogy, what we want to have is equal contributions from the id, the ego, and the superego in a well-developed personality. So basically the id is the first system that is present at birth. When you're born, you are all id. Okay? You could think of the id, if you want, as a, as a biology system. And these are not Freud's terms that I'm suggesting, hence the quotes. But in essence, the id has as its primary goal survival of you as an organism. Okay? It, in other words, it is dealing with your needs as an organism, your, your biological needs. And the relevant verb here is want. The id totally endorses the idea of I want what I want when I want it. No consideration for you at all. And according to Freud, the, the, um, the id operates in terms of what he called the pleasure principle. That is, in terms of, of uh, satisfying the various instinctive urges, the id is all about the business of doing so. It operates in terms of the pleasure principle, and the only thing it seeks is gratification for itself. So an id-dominated organism is working only to better its own life without any concern to the costs of anybody else. Now clearly that does not totally describe us, so there's some other factors that are going to kick in here. But at birth, if you think about it, an infant is interested in food, water, warmth, and contact comfort, and that's it. If any of those are shortcomings, if it gets hungry, it screams. And if it gets hungry at 3 in the morning, it screams. That is, I want what I want when I want it. If I'm hungry now, I want food now. And so in essence, the, the body is entire, the personality is entirely dominated by the id during the first year or so. The second element that develops is the ego. The ego is basically going to become, is going to develop essentially to monitor the id and channel its impulses. In other words, it's going to become essentially an executive. I meant to suggest one other analogy for you in terms of the id. Stealing from the cookie jar at home is an example of id-dominated behavior. Okay? You know that mom was going to use the cookies for dessert. You know there are four cookies. You've got your sister and you and two parents. So you figure, well, yeah, four cookies for dessert. Each of us gets a cookie. But you get hungry and mom isn't watching the cookie jar at 3.45, huh? And so you go in and take the cookie. In fact, you take two just to make sure your hunger's assuaged. And as you think about it, since you're going to get beaten on anyway, you might as well go ahead and take all four and just pig out. So you eat all four cookies without a thought for anybody else. That is id-dominated behavior. Stealing from the cookie jar is a good example of id-dominated behavior. When the, super, when the ego comes in, what it really does is to, is to essentially become what we could call, if you want, a psychology system. That is, it is interested in impacting your behavior in, in actually, surprisingly, in helpful ways. And Freud said that the, the, um, the ego operates in terms of what we would call, what he calls, the reality principle. That is Freud's term. Basically what he does, what it does, is to emphasize rationality. Okay? It's going to emphasize an awareness of the realities, both physical and social, in our everyday world that we really have to operate in terms of. And so in essence, what it's arguing is that we're, um, it is the executive branch. And so, you know, you sit down at the dining room table when you're four years old and the, the ego is beginning to kick in, age three and four. You look around the table and you realize that your brother has this great looking roll on his plate. And your parents aren't there right now, so you're thinking, okay, I'll just reach over and snitch it. But what the ego does is to introduce the idea that, first of all, that your brother is bigger than you, he's louder than you, and if you steal his role, he's going to scream and mash you in the nose. So what the ego does is to suggest subtly 
that what maybe you ought to do is to negotiate. What you need to do is convince your brother that your role is better than his role. And if you can actually pull that off, the brother will then give you the role that you were after, which solves the id's need. Okay? So in essence, the reality that is introduced is the physical social reality of which you and I are a part. Red lights in our lives are a pain in the neck. But in fact, the, absent, the absence of red lights would be markedly worse ultimately, not only in terms of accidents, but just the sheer convenience of getting somewhere. Um, it's nice to have an unobstructed path through the intersection. Um, so we tolerate them. Mom wants you to clean your room. And if you decide when she's standing there with a hairbrush reminding you that you weren't, you're supposed to clean your room, you'll go do that. And while you're cleaning it with the enforcer right there, your ego is very likely to suggest to you that now would be a good time to hit her up for the cookies. Gee, Mom, I've cleaned the room like you've been asking me to, to do for four months. Could I have some cookies when I get done? How can she say no to such an innocent request from a babbling four-year-old? Okay, but in that case, the enforcer still has to be actively there. That is, there's a physical impediment between you and the cookies. So you negotiate. I'll clean the room if you'll give me the cookies. Or will you give me the cookies if I clean my room? That's ego-dominated kind of activities. So where the id is I want, the ego is you can. It is the enabler. It is the do, did, done kind of verb approach. It is dealing with how to enable and, and foster achievement of the its goals, but to do so with the least cost, both physically and, and socially. Finally, when the superego arrives, the deadline here is even vaguer, but I would say roughly age maybe seven or eight is when the superego begins to kick in. What the superego essentially represents is what we might call a sociological or theological system. What it essentially is, is our incorporated values. The things that we are interested in having um, and, and espousing, the, the behaviors that we want to maintain. In some ways, you could think of the superego arguing or operating in terms of what I'm going to call a moral principle. Again, it's in quotes because this is not Freud's idea, but just my suggestion. The superego is essentially your incorporated values. Age seven or eight, all of a sudden one day a child is going to clean his or her room just because it felt good to do so and then feel very comfortable going out to reward themselves for a cookie from the cookie jar. But in essence, in that case, you have the operations of the, of the superego, which is the repository of, of values, your personal values, and also the ideals of society as a whole. The id is irrationally representing only you. The superego represents irrationally only the goods of society. So in essence, you've got two parts of your personality charging in exactly opposite directions. The id is me, 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 and the superego is the, the, the. The ego is left in the middle as the executive. And what it's trying to do is to achieve a balance across both of those systems simultaneously. So the ego ultimately becomes the executive of the personality. It is the operating system. And it operates effectively as long as the id and the superego can be guided so that they're pointing in more or less the same direction. To anticipate where I'm headed with this, and I think I may be anticipating something we'll come to a little bit later, this is where personality difficulties develop in the mind of Freud. That is, if you have a personality difficulty that shows up, it's going to show up as anxiety in this particular area. Because it, the anxiety is basically because the ego is beginning to sense that it's losing control of either the id or the superego. I'll come back and introduce that concept a little bit later. Now, in terms of the dynamics of the system, Freud basically developed a system of, of instincts, which he talked about at great length. This is essentially the way in which the psychic energy was, was, was channeled. But in essence, he talked first of all about what we call life instincts. These are represented or labeled by Freud sometimes eros, and it is from here that the word erotic and things related to eroticism actually are originally derived. He has an impact in literature and even in language with this theory. Um, the primary drive that is involved here is the sex drive. Um, and it is primarily a life-oriented um, drive or, or urge that we, um, that we have. Coupled with that are the, is the death instinct, uh, or the death instincts, I should say, represented by, as Freud called it, Thanatos. Um, a god of death, if you want to think about it that way. The primary representative drive for, for death-oriented instincts is aggression. And what you have here are two very powerful opposite operating drives. Life driving you toward, um, toward, toward sex and, and successful interactive things. Aggression driving you toward death and various other uh, bad things that may actually happen to us. And the raising of a child then is a matter of walking a very delicate line to balance off the positive forces in a youngster's life against the negative forces. 
as we'll see. One example of the subtleness of, of his theory was uh, represented in a movie called The Loved Ones, which came out about 15 years ago now. It was the story, it was a, it was a takeoff, a, a sparse, um, a spoof of um, funeral homes um, in Los Angeles, the, the trumpet blowing uh, helicopter flying uh, uh, funeral home uh, business. And one of the lead characters in that, one of the associate directors of the funeral home that was the subject of that movie was a Miss Thanatogenes which is a magnificent combination of thanatos, or death, and genes, which is the essential element of life, to give you an idea of the subtlety with which this theory operates in, in some instances. In terms of the instincts, basically, then, Freud hypothesized that there were four features that, instinct, that each instinct has. First of all, it has a source, a bodily need of some sort. Secondly, it has an aim, um, that is need satisfaction, basically. So he's got essentially a drive reduction theory here that he's operating with or describing. Third is an object. We would have called that a goal in the cycle that we talked about back in motivation, emotion. And finally then, it has an impetus, and that is the, it, which has the force of an instinct. That's the drive that moves you to get food when you're hungry, and Freud would argue is, is, um, is basically id-driven. The um, the operation here, uh, th this is where I was going to talk specifically about anxiety. Um, and th this comes from, as I said, the imbalance that will sometimes exist between the id, the ego, and the superego. You are about to come into final exams. You're thinking and reviewing all the courses you're in and how well you're doing, that you've still got three papers to write, you've got 19 chapters still to read, you've got a word list you've got to generate, and all sorts of assignments, all of which are due by three weeks from today, right? Or two weeks or one week from today, they're due. And that may lead to realistic anxiety on your part. You're under stress right now, which is in the nature of academia at the end of a semester. It always happens. That's realistic stress. That is reality-oriented stress. That's not treatable, other than perhaps giving you skills in organizing yourselves better. But we tried that at the beginning of the semester. If you're stressed now, it ain't my fault. The second type is what we would call neurotic anxiety. This is actually the starting point for neurosis as a, as a form of mental disorder, as we will see it later in, in psychopathology. Um, and it comes in this theory from the ego's growing fear that it is losing control of the id. So in essence, neurotic anxiety, as Freud captured it, is essentially the ego sensing that it's beginning to lose control of the, of the id, and that it's not able to shield the id from some of the consequences of its act. The other type of, of anxiety that may develop is moral anxiety, uh, which is less frequent but, but just as present when it occurs. And that occurs if the, if the organism begins to fear, if the id begins to sense that it's losing control of the superego. So those are the two major forms of anxiety that, that will lead to diagnosable and treatable problems, according to um, Freud and psychoanalysis. Now. This is where defense mechanisms actually kick in. That is what the, id, what the ego does, is to create defense mechanisms. I'm going to hold off talking those until we get into psychopathology, because that's where they really fit best. But defense mechanisms are actually generated by the ego, sometimes with conscious and most times without conscious awareness, as we will see. Now, in terms of the development of personality, there are basically two related concepts here um, that we can talk about. One of these is the idea of erogenous zones. This is another concept that traces originally to the work of Sigmund Freud. He proposed the development of um, erogenous zones, which is a part of the skin or an area of the body which yields pleasure when it is manipulated. And these zones will shift as we, um, as we develop. But the original concept of erogenous zones, or zones of pleasure, is a Freudian concept. And the other thing that also occurs here is the idea of fixation. And that is that if you get too much pleasure in a given area, you may fixate there either because things are too pleasurable, that is the sex drive is dominating, or because they're too frustrating. That is, the aggressive drives are dominating, and you get boxed in by, by frustration or anything else. The analogy that Freud suggested here in terms of the stages of development that I'm about to talk about um, was the idea of marching an army, i.e. your psychic energy, across a desert to fight the battle of life itself. And so in essence, what's going to happen is we're going to stop at each of four oases in fairly short order and then move on to the fifth stage, which is the last stage of personality, according to Freud. But if you kind of keep in mind an, an analogy of an army fighting a battle, fixation then may occur either if things are too easy or if they're too difficult. Either way, you fixate. 
because if you think about trying to move that libidinal energy on, you wake the troops up in the morning and there's been sex, wine, and fun all night long, the troops are going to say to you, four-day march, battle about life, get a grip. Things are too good here. And the result is you fixate, you overinvest psychic energy at a given stage. Psychoanalysis then is going to involve reaching back into your childhood to find out what happened at that stage that caused you to fixate, to overinvest psychic energy, either because you were overly pleasured or because you were overly frustrated. This, so, erogenous zones and fixation are the underlying concepts for the stages that we'll now uh, talk about here. Um, fixation and frustration I've already talked about, so we'll just move on here rapidly. Um, the developmental stages, first of all, are oral. That is, when you're born, you are all id and you're all mouth. If you hand a toy to a youngster who's eight or nine months old, what do they do with it? Right into their mouth. Okay, which is the reason we now have federal laws about the size of objects that Burger King and, and um, um, uh, not Walmart, uh, McDonald's can, can give away. They have to be large enough so that an infant can't mistakenly put it in its mouth and, and choke to death. But that's a function of the oral stage. In the oral stage, the pleasure source is the mouth itself. Um, and essentially all of the, the infant's interactions with the world are through the mouth, eating, drinking, and so forth, all mouth-related activities. And that is basically through the entire first year of life um, uh, that this occurs. And the results here are either gullibility, if, you over, if, if things are too easy for you, you'll believe anything, you'll literally swallow anything. Or at the other extreme, sarcasm or biting wit, which is another consequence of going through the, the, um, the oral stage and being frustrated in that, in that stage. The second stage then is the anal stage, and the obvious source of pleasure here is the anus. Um, elimination or constipation are two of the, the possible results during this stage, and this is primarily during the second year of, of life. The results here uh, basically may spell out of one of the key events which occurs here, and that is uh, toilet training. Okay? Toilet training is one of the key events that goes on here, and what you're basically exercising with your parents when you go through toilet training is a basic lesson, according to Freud, in the economics of life. It is literally give and take. And what you're supposed to do is learn to give at the right time, go to the bathroom when you're asked to, and not give, withhold when you're, when you're not supposed to be giving. And that can be the source of considerable confrontational activity between parents and children. Um, but it's the first example of power that a youngster really has. Mama offers to have you go to the toilet before you're going to be dressed up for church or synagogue, and finally just gives up. You decide it's yours, I'm going to keep it. And so she then dresses in your, you're in, in your white finery and you're headed out the door and then all of a sudden you have a change of heart. Okay, you wanted it? Here it is. And in essence, that is the battle of toilet training that's going on. There are two types of personality that will most likely result out of this. One is the anal retentive, who's fastidious on the outside and a mess on the inside, or the anal expulsive, the person who is sloppy. The classic example of that is what Broadway show, and I'm blocking on the name. Felix and Oscar, the odd, the odd couple, thank you. And you weren't even on mic or we would have given you 30 points, but too late. <laughs> Better late than never. <laughs> In essence, that is a confrontation of an anal retentive Felix with an anal expulsive Oscar. One of my all-time favorite commercials was for a potato chip, a new one that was introduced, and they got those two characters to play and in essence, Felix came in, very neatly and pristinely unwrapped this new bag of potato chips, took out one chip, put it on the counter, carefully rolled the bag up, clipped it, put it away, no crumbs anywhere, examined the chip and talked to us about how good it was, and then ate it. No crumbs, nothing. Oscar walks in, and Felix made the mistake of saying, would you like to try one of these? They're really good. Oscar did, unclipped the bag, opened it up, poured it out on the table, scooped up a handful, slammed the whole mess in his mouth, crumbs going everywhere, okay? The confrontation between an anal retentive and an anal um, uh, expulsive is a, is a match made in hell. It is a pair that is destined not to survive, okay? But those are problems that come out of things either being too easy or too difficult for you in stage two, the anal stage. Next then, we look at the third stage, which is the phallic stage. This is the first time the sex organs show up as, a, as an area of pleasure. And the, the actual pleasure source here is the genitalia for the first time. I am sure you have seen um, youngsters age three, four, and five walking around 
um, Walmart scratching their genitalia as they do so with a grin on their face. It feels good, it's nice, it's fun. Um, and remember, it's still predominantly id-dominated. I, you know, I want what I want when I want it, we'll do it now because I need to, and so forth. So the pleasure source are the genitalia in a very socially insensitive way. Okay? And the time is basically roughly age three to five or six years of age. Um, Interestingly enough, um, the problem here is homosexuality, and this is one case where Freud was really wide of, of what the American Psychological Association has essentially always believed. The American Psychiatric Association for years viewed homosexuality as a psychological problem. The American Psychological Association never did. And about 20 years ago, the American Psychiatric Association, Psychiatric Association got a lot of very positive press because they finally came out and said, now wait a minute, it's a choice of lifestyle. If it isn't causing problems, there's nothing to treat. There's no abnormality. Um, and that really squares with what most of modern day psychology would, would endorse theoretically. Uh, but the difficulties, according to Freud, of that kind would have traced back to the phallic stage. Following then comes, um, oh, and another thing that I should also talk about is the Oedipus complex, which is a little boy problem. Um, the problem is that you're between three and six years of age, you're driven with sex for the first time, and what you do is to lust after your mother and actively compete with your father for her attention, which is a no-no, ultimately, because your mother is married to your father, and you really need to learn how to go get a mother of your own speaking from the male perspective. So the Oedipus complex is directly paralleled by the female parallel to that, which is the Electra complex. Here's an example of where Freud was actually quite sexist in his theory, because it was about 25 years after the original proposal of the Oedipus, of the Oedipus complex, I keep mispronouncing that, the Oedipus complex, um, that Jung and Adler were finally able to convince Freud that in fact little girls faced exactly the same kind of a problem. That is that they lust after their, their father and view the mother as a rival for his attentions. And that kind of reorganization has to occur. Instead of lusting after the opposite sex parent, what you have to learn to do is to model yourself after the same sex parent so that you can mature into adolescence and adulthood and go find a, a mate of your own. But that balance is struck and, and achieved during the, um, the phallic stage, and that's the reason that Freud, this uh, resolution of the Oedipus Electra complexes, uh, is the reason that Freud thought that, that um, homosexuality was a problem generated out of this stage. Again, modern psychology, psychiatry, do not any longer endorse that idea. The latent stage has no particular pleasure source. There are no conflicts here either, but it lasts basically from age six, roughly, through pu into puberty. Um, and the, the net result here is that this may be as much a product of our society as anything else, but Freud basically didn't think there were any conflicts here. Um, and in essence, it was just a stage that, that you moved through. It was, it was a balanced investment of energy kind of across all levels of, of need. Um, and the major adjustment problems throughout personality development are really attributed to any of these stages across here as you move into the last stage, which is the genital stage. And the genital stage basically arrives at the beginning of adolescence, and it lasts through entire, your entire life. Um, so the, the pleasure source really is, is life itself in, in some ways. There, there's no, um, in fact, that's a typing error that's left over from what I was saying about the latent stage. The actual pleasure source here is life itself. Uh, scratch what's on the screen there. Uh, the time is essentially from the entering adolescence until you die. Um, and, and the personality difficulties that show up then are largely a function of, of difficulties predominantly in your childhood, typically the first, second, and third stages, oral, anal, and phallic stages. Freud was very much a product of his time. His concentration on energy, as we showed earlier, was, was attributable to the, the presence of energy in, in the traditional natural sciences. The theory is too global. It's a broad stroke treatment of humans, but it's very difficult to, to bring into the, la to the laboratory. It gives relatively little emphasis, too little emphasis to the environment, and too much emphasis on inherited tendencies and childhood. Uh, and yet for all of its problems, it is still the single most influential theory that has ever been developed in, um, in psychology. And it has impacts well beyond um, the, um, the theory itself. If we look at um, criticizing the theory, I've just offered that, and let's move on into the third section. My thumb is a little behind my mouth here this afternoon, uh, this morning, today, whenever you're viewing me, us. Let's look now at another theory. This one has a very interesting theory. More generally, we might want to call these the behavioral theories or the learning theories or maybe the social learning theories, but there are some that really don't involve social processes, just learning. Um, 
In any case, these theories originally were created in the 1930s and 40s, and they represented an attempt to bring psychoanalysis, which boomed during the, the, um, the units and teens and 20s. Um, they, they were an attempt to bring that theory into the laboratory. So the original behavioral analyses uh, of personality were really an attempt to bring Freud into the laboratory, and it didn't work. Uh, basically. And the net result was that what came out of that early work was a theory that is quite different, uh, involving, for instance, one of the earliest was developed by Dollard and Miller, um, and that features a stimulus-response analysis, and you'll be amazed how much simpler their structure is. Their structure view of personality was really that you had only one concept that you needed to worry about, and that is a habit. And basically what they then argue is that a habit is simply a link or an association that exists between a stimulus, which serves a cue function, and a response. So in essence, what they're arguing is that you and I walk around with a bunch of habits, that is, things that we normally do in a given situation, and we're considered to be normally developed if we do the right thing in the right place. Any of you could stand up here right now during the 75th year at the University of Houston and scream out, go Cougs, yay you H, which wouldn't be appropriate in a classroom, but it would be highly appropriate over at Hoffheinz during a basketball game. Okay, so in essence, the, the, what drives this is what's called the, and this is a very traditional, not frequently used concept now, but it's very much a part of the old SR theory, is what's called the habit family hierarchy. That is, in any given situation or environment, you and I have a lot of different possible responses we could exhibit. You and I carry around with us all of the response potential we have, and what really separates us as normal people from those who are considered mentally ill or disbalanced in some way is the choice that we make between doing things that are appropriate in a situation or things that are inappropriate. It's nothing more than an injudicious selection of habits is what a behaviorist is ultimately going to argue and they're modifiable by changing the environment. So I'm giving you both the psychopathology and the psychotherapy that's involved when we look at the, um, the habit family hierarchy here. Now, related to that, we then have dynamics. So the entire structure, the id, the ego, and the superego of personality in behavioral therapy or theory is wrapped up simply in the habit, the links that we've formed between stimuli and responses. In terms of operating the system, the key element here is drive. And I'm going to show you four different versions of this, but it all ties back originally to the concept of a drive, which is basically simply a strong stimulus that leads to action. Okay? That's a drive. That, however, also has, and, and this theory is arguing then, that the only things that really drive us, in quotes, at the beginning of, of life are hunger and thirst. So basically it's going to suggest that all of the, the drives initially are simply primary drives, given the terminology we were using in motivation and motion, that they're physiological needs that we have. Okay? This theory goes on, however, to talk about the development of secondary drives. And here's where you begin to combine concepts. But in essence, what they're arguing with a secondary drive is that those are basically the responses that we learn that may be associated uh, frequently with primary drives. That is, that if you have a particular kind of behavior that you typically exhibit when you get hungry, you're likely to do it again. So the idea of going from here to a, to a candy bar machine if you're hungry after lecture is a secondary drive that's operating here. Primary and or the, the drives and secondary drives are the primary dynamics of the, um, of the personality according to this theory, but they do also add in two other concepts. One is reinforcement, and you'll see that this is very much a drive reduction theory that is being used here. And then obviously we can also talk about secondary reinforcements, which are basically the, the events that are, that are um, um, that basically gain the ability to increase the frequency of response because they're associated repeatedly with the, the primary reinforcers. I rush over that because those definitions are already in the, the book and they really just repeat the basic elements of drive and, and um, secondary drives. Now, in terms of development, um, the initial behaviors that you and I exhibit are a combination of just specific reflexes and primary drives and what are sometimes referred to as innate response hierarchies. That is, if you put a nipple in a youngster's mouth, it will suck automatically. It does not have to learn how to do so. It's an inherited tendency which is there. Um, learning, 
of the drives of the various Q functions of habits and the responses and so forth is a second element that contributes to the development of personality. In this theory, um, what happens basically is that the innate response hierarchies, the things that we're capable of doing automatically as, as infants, basically gradually mature into what are called the resultant hierarchies or the, the habit family hierarchies that we now have. In different situations, you have a series of strategies that you can actually try um, for um, responding in any, in any particular situation. Childhood is, is important in this theory um, simply because of, of the issues that are hung around things like feeding and infancy and all of the drives that spin off of that. Uh, toilet training and the things that you learn there about responding positively when given reinforcers. Uh, early sex training and even learning to control uh, anger and, and uh, various motives and so forth. All of that is really done in childhood and young adolescence. But this theory has the advantage that those same principles operate throughout your life. So if you arrive at age 40 and all of a sudden you have a behavioral problem, this theory is going to argue that the therapist should go back and modify the reinforcers in your life. Now, a modification of this was proposed ultimately in the form of what is specifically called social learning theory. And this was the work of Bandura and Walters. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this because basically what they did was to simply add the idea of observational skills. So essentially what they did was to downplay the importance of reinforcement and increase the importance of observation. But the, the, the basic driving element is still habit uh, as, as educated by observation rather than habit and drive. Um, the dynamics then are, are suggesting that, that yes, there are drives, um, but in essence the secondary drives and the reinforcers become particularly important. Um, I, scratch that. The drives and secondary drives are important, but reinforcement is not considered important in the Bandura and Walters social learning approach. That is, they're saying you and I can learn just by watching and we don't have to do anything else. So we don't need to worry about, in this theory, we don't need to worry about the concept of, of secondary drives. Uh, sec I'm sorry, secondary reinforcers. Reinforcement as such is sidelined in this theory for exactly the same logic as we sidelined it when we talked about observational learning. And thirdly then, in terms of, of development, uh, it is basically observational learning that we develop new responses without necessarily having any obvious reinforcer witness the fact that you're here today watching the tape or me. Um, and trying to track down the exact reinforcer for that activity might be extraordinarily difficult for both of us. Simply watching a model will impact your internal cognitive structure according to social learning theory. But again, you'll notice there's been a real swing here over in the direction of the importance of environment. Yes, physiology plays a minor role in terms of the original primary drives, um, but that's about it. Most everything else is done related to, to learning um, of various kinds of responses. In terms of critiquing this, um, these theories generally, um, they may have oversimplified the concept. That is to, to have all of personality racked up simply as a series of habits and interactions between habits and drives may be overemphasizing um, or oversimplifying, I should say. Secondly, there's probably too little emphasis of heredity and too much emphasis of, of environmental factors. And yet, there are some positives. That is, this is a theory that is very easy to bring into the laboratory because that was where it was originally established and it actually generates a lot of highly testable predictions. So it's elegantly simple and it is a good source of, of um, predictions. Now, the final group, and I don't know whether we'll have time to finish it today. I'd like to just to end this in a nice logical way, but I'm not sure we can do it in a minute and 45 seconds, but let's try. The central assertion here is that personality is essentially the essential nature of personality consists in the inner experiences of the individual, the understanding of which provides freedom for action and choice that is necessary for personal satisfaction and human fulfillment. You are hearing words there for the first time that really are very important to you and I in terms of our personality. The key concepts for this theory include things like um, inner experience and self-perception, understanding those experiences, freedom that we gain by that understanding, and even satisfaction and fulfillment. All of those are concepts that are real central to you and me in terms of how we live our lives, um, but it's really the first time that these are proposed is as part of what is called self theory. The theory of Carl Rogers, for instance, was very um, it was central. Was essentially summarized by that statement that I just uh, just read for you there. Carl Rogers' theory has as a central element of his of its structure what we call essentially the organism. 
The organism is basically the locus of all experience, everything that is going on at any given time. The buzz that you can hear out of your TV or in the room you're in right now, uh, the people who are next to you scratching or, or folding a page or doing whatever they're doing, it's part of the organism. It's part of the total environment that you and I share. What makes you and me unique is the fact that there is also, as part of that, what we call our phenomenal field. That is essentially our window of observation. That's what opens up when you and I wake up in the morning is our, our phenomenal field. So if you and I go to a restaurant and eat a meal, we share the restaurant environment, but my phenomenal field is you, and your phenomenal field is viewing me. Pick it up tomorrow.